Hello and welcome to York Observatory's weekly tell to broadcast, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends at York University. We are broadcasting live from the Alan I. Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. York YouTube broadcasts most Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time at youtube.com slash user slash York U Observatory slash live. For any questions or comments you have of our past shows, or if you have any suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. You can always connect with us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and on Facebook at Alan I. Carswell Obs. We would like to inform you about the Summer 2023 Astronomer in Residence Program. This program is a collaboration of the Alan I. Carswell Observatory with Killarney Provincial Park to host astronomers in the certified dark sky site of Killarney to lead in-person presentations and shows using the park's observatory. The second to lead and uh, the second 2023 astronomer in residence arrived at Killarney Park recently on July 10th. Quentin Waveridge is the outreach coordinator for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada at the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, where he helps host monthly events and educational talks with researchers and educators within the astron astronomy community. If you are at Killarney Park, make sure to stop by the observatory and say hi. In the meantime, the astronomy residents blogs can be found at yourq.ca slash science slash observatory slash AIR slash astronomer dash in dash residence dash blog. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sergi, and I'm here with Mariana, Kem, and Pramit, and of course, our esteemed guest this evening, Mahin Himani, and we're here from the Al Nye Carso Observatory at York University. Tonight, we've got a great presentation about quasars by our esteemed guest, Mehin Hamani, who will be shortly introduced by Cam. Now to start, I would like to mention that the observatory at your campus is in Toronto, and we would like to welcome you all to our show and to acknowledge the traditional lands that our telescope is on. The observatory acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, our stargazing and astronomical efforts during the long history and current practices of astronomy for this land. The observatory looks forward to continuing to learn and revitalizing our knowledge in this area. Welcome, everyone. Before we get started with our main show, we want to give you a little update of what you can see this coming week in Ontario. The moon is in the waxing crescent phase with an illumination of 2.81% as seen from Earth. This is a phase where the moon is starting to become visible again after the new moon. Meaning, in this phase, the moon will go from 0.1% to 49.9% illumination before reaching the first quarter phase. The waxing crescent phase, like all moon phases, will last just over seven days. Although only a small part of the moon is illuminated in this phase, you can still sometimes faintly see the rest of the moon. This is known as Earth shine. The sunset tonight is at 8.56 p.m. EDT, and there are many objects in the sky to see. Starting off with the hottest planet in our solar system, Venus will be up. It will be visible just after sunset, pretty close to the horizon, so you can catch a glimpse of this interesting planet. Our red planet Mars will also be up and can be found not too far away from Venus. Mars will be up after sunset and will be up for a little while in the night sky before it sets just before 11 p.m. EDT. The red giant branch star Arcturus will also be up in the night sky along with the variable star Vega. Other celestial objects such as Spica, Altair, Polaris, and many more will be up throughout the night. All of the objects will be visible to the naked eye on a clear, dark sky. However, the use of binoculars or a telescope for viewing is always encouraged. These objects are super cool and definitely something you do not want to miss. So make sure to get outside and look up at the stars. Now I'd like to give it away to Cam so she can introduce our guest speaker for tonight's Teletube. Thank you, Mariana. Hello, everyone. For today's scientific episode, our guest speaker is Mahin Halani, who is in her first year of undergraduate honors degree in astrophysics at George University. Mahin has always been captivated by astronomy, but she discovered that schools at the time did not frequently cover this subject 
in depth. Nevertheless, to participate as a member of Central Health in Pakistan to learn more about the subject and get active in amateur observation and study. To join York University in 2020 and learn to determine several locations to classify galaxies and access exoplanets in various astronomy groups. Furthermore, she joined RNL Tesla and Preparatory and worked there for two years where she engaged in continuing research on lower the stars and learned how to operate the one year telescope, which is the biggest on any Canadian university campus. Some of her research interests are dark energy, dark matter, and the origin and evolution of the universe. She worked as a research assistant under the supervision of Dr. Patrick Paul. Is the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University. Her question is will be about the work she has performed on her supervision this summer. Specifically, she will be talking about her research with understanding and mission and her social activities and what makes them useful to us in understanding the unit. We are glad to have you for today's fellowship episode. Okay. Please go ahead and take it away. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, just a second. I'll just present. All right. Uh, I hope you guys can see my screen. All right. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight and excited to share some of the interesting things I have found while working as a research assistant under the supervision of Professor Hall this summer. Um, before I start, I wanted to mention that since the data I actually worked with from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, is the most recent data I had, so I wasn't really able to show that today since it hasn't been publicly released, but I did find some similar uh, spectra that um, I can show today. So um, even though it's not the most recent one, uh, it's of the similar targets, so I hope that um, like I'm sad about that, but I just wanted to mention that. And it is publicly available on the SDSSS website in case if uh, anyone is interested in looking at the data uh, on their own. So before we dive deep into talking about quasars, I just wanna give a little bit of an outline of what I will be talking about today. Uh, I will start with introducing quasars, uh, just so we know what we're talking about. Uh, I will then move on to talk a little bit about the uh, standard spectra of stars and um, galaxies, just so we have something to compare with. Um, and then we can actually look at some of the spectra from the SDSS that I found interesting. Um, and I will end off the talk by giving a little bit of um, a bigger picture of how this research can be useful for us uh, in understanding the universe um, and the galaxy evolution in particular. So before we dive deep into quasars and look at some of the uh, spectra of objects, let's talk a little bit about what quasars are. So in order to really understand quasars, we first need to understand the difference between active galaxies versus inactive galaxies. Um, and active galactic nuclei or active galaxies are differentiated from inactive galaxies based on the presence of supermassive black hole, um, which is being accreted in their centers. So AGNs have a broad range of luminosities. Uh, the ones with largest luminosities uh, are known as quasars. So in order to understand this definition of presence of supermassive creating black holes in the centers, think of a black hole in the center of a galaxy uh, and gases spiraling at high velocity in that extremely large black hole. Um, and since black holes due to their very high gravity um, basically eat everything that comes near them, uh, this gas, when it falls into the black hole, is heated up to millions of degrees, causing the emission of thermal radiation, spanning the spectrum, making it bright invisible spectrum, as well as X-rays. 
Um, and due to their high luminosities, they can outshine all of the stars in the galaxy they are a part of. Um, so they're the most luminous and the most distant objects that are actually known to us. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that these objects are at very large distances from us. Um, and the closest one is 800 million years away, which is still quite far. And this has led to the conclusion that there are no quasars in the universe today with the last one disappearing 800 million years ago. Um, so if you ask where did they go, we don't know for sure. And based on what their power source is, it could be that they just ran out of fuel, which was the gas and dust which was surrounding the black hole. All was just consumed by the black hole. Um, so I hope this was a little bit of uh, a useful introduction on quasars. Um, now let's look at uh, some standard spectra. This is the spectrum of a typical star. Uh, for those of you who have looked at spectra before, it is very easy to identify that this is a very hot star uh, with Balmer absorption lines and is a white dwarf. So these uh, absorption lines that you can see are from H alpha, beta, gamma. These are the Balmer absorption lines. And this kind of downward curve shows that it is a blue star. Um, so it is very hot. Um, and this is what a typical white dwarf spectrum looks like. Um, what you will notice is that this spectrum does not have very strong emission lines, as that is most of the time something you will not see in stellar spectra. Uh, one of the reasons for this is the emission of photons from the electrons in a completely new direction than our line of sight. So it isn't that there isn't any emissions within the stars. It's just that when the photons are emitted, a lot of the times they're just emitted in a very different direction. Um, and so they're not in our line of sight. And when we look at spectra in general, we don't see a lot of emission lines um, when it comes to stars. Um, and, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, this sort of um, downward curve shows that this is a very hot blue star. Um, so this is something to keep in mind when we look at more uh, spectrum of quasars. Um, this is the second spectra that I wanted to show. Um, this is the spectrum of a typical galaxy. Um, so galaxies have a fairly flat overall spectrum since they are, of course, composed of many, many stars, uh, or we can say black bodies, even though stars aren't, don't really completely behave as black bodies, but because it's composed of so many different stars, um, it results in a range of temperatures, which causes the continuum to become more flat. Um, and most galaxy spectra are redshifted, which means that their spectral features have shifted to a longer wavelength than the rest wavelength, implying that they are moving away from us. Um, you will see some emission features within uh, different types of galaxies, which is uh, different from what we talked about stars. So you'll still see some emission lines uh, when you look at the spectrum of galaxies. Now, moving on to quasars, this is uh, a standard low redshift quasar. Um, as you can see, <laughs> in comparison to the spectra that we looked at before, this looks very different. Um, so it has these um, emission lines, which are actually quite clear. And um, this strong O3 emission line is the reason that we cannot really see the, the worth uh, of these emission lines since the uh, O3 emission is so strong that the overall graph, you cannot clearly see that, which you will see as we go further. Uh, but these are broadened um, emission lines. Um, and here, uh, I'd like to mention that the y-axis is showing flux in these units that are mentioned here, and the x-axis is showing wavelength in angstroms. And these blue ticks that you'll notice is showing um, is, is basically uh, showing emission lines that are caused from different gases that are present within the quasar. So when you see an emission line at every blue tick, it suggests that the redshift predicted by the pipeline is correct, uh, which in this case it is. So the pipeline predicted the redshift of this quasar as 0.36 approximately. Um, and since all of the blue ticks are aligning and have an emission line 
um, at every point, uh, it means that the redshift was correctly predicted. And this is a little redshift quasar. Now I'd like you to um, remember where magnesium is here. And now when we look at a standard high redshift quasar, we see that magnesium has actually moved a lot. It's, it's actually much more redshifted. So it's now here. Um, which is why this is a high redshift quasar because it's a larger redshift. Um, and here you can clearly see these broadened um, emission lines. Uh, in this case, the broadened emission lines are very obvious, and these are the distinguishing features when it comes to a quasar spectrum. So some common emissions you will observe are caused from Lyman alpha, which is uh, a result of neutral hydrogen. Um, and then we also have silicon-4 uh, plus O4, here C4, C3, uh, helium-2, magnesium. Um, so we have um, all of these uh, emissions, which you'll see in a lot of uh, quasar spectra. So quasars are intrinsically blue because of how hot they are, as we discussed before the downward curve. But if there is sufficient gas present along the line of sight, they can also be uh, reddened. All right, so, okay. So now let's look at some of the interesting um, things that I found. So this is one of the first spectra that I thought were very uh, interesting because um, something that you'll notice in here is a little unusual. So this is a low redshift quasar, very usual looking at first, but when I looked at the blue ticks, I noticed that the broad Balmer uh, emission is red shifted from the narrow emission lines. Um, that is, if you look at the narrow emission lines, which are zoomed in here on the top, you'll see that the blue ticks don't align with the emission lines, but it does with the broad emission line, which doesn't make sense because if, if all of the blue ticks are showing emission lines, then why aren't these ones specifically aligning? Um, so that doesn't mean that um, the red shift is wrong, uh, it could just mean that there's something else going on in terms of uh, the gases and their velocities. Um, and so I found that the exact redshift difference was approximately 2,500 kilometers per second. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what could be causing this, but uh, there can be multiple reasons that could potentially explain uh, why this could be happening. So if we were to further look into this and figure out what uh, potential reasons could be causing this um, misalignment, uh, then we can understand um, the, the way quasars are behaving, uh, or this particular target is behaving. Um, but we will also have to look at some other spectra from more newer data and see if this is actually uh, an actual thing happening or if it's just a glitch, because sometimes there can be glitches. Um, so... I think that's pretty much it for this one. Um, so this is uh, a special type of quasar, uh, which are of particular interest to us during our work. So they do look very interesting as well, as you can see with the very broad um, and obvious absorption lines, which we have not seen in any of the spectra we've looked at uh, up until now. So they're, they're very interesting looking to me. Um, and the redshift for this is high as well. Uh, the broadness of the quasar absorption can range from thousands to even tens of thousands of kilometers per second. Um, and when the broadness is large, uh, large, then they're known as broad absorption line quasars. Um, if you're wondering what is causing this uh, broadness, um, then it is caused by gas near the quasar's central engine producing intrinsic absorption lines such as Lyman alpha. And there are also high ionization metal transitions such as C4 and uh, nitrogen 5, O6, as I mentioned before as well. Um, and most of the absorption lines in a typical quasar spectrum are produced due to intervening gas. That is, it is produced by gas unrelated to the quasar, um, which is located along the line of sight between the quasar and Earth, as we need to keep in mind that there is a lot of potential gas that is blocking our view of the quasar. So we also need to um, think about that when we're looking at the spectra. So a lot of the uh, smaller absorption lines, I should say, or 
uh, less broad absorption lines are also caused due to that. Um, so this is something that um, Professor Hall has worked on a lot. Um, and so if you were to look uh, up uh, broad absorption line quasars, you'll probably find some interesting papers that you can read on this. Um, this is a weak line quasar, um, and it is also a very high redshift. It's a redshift of 3.9, uh, which is much larger than what we've been seeing until now. Um, so basically, it's just a quasar with weak or undetectable ultraviolet emission lines, as can be noticed at those wavelengths in the spectrum, that the emission lines are not as strong once you get to these higher wavelengths. Um, and these are interesting only because they're rare, so you don't find these spectra as often as you find other types of spectra that I discussed before. Um, I also want, wanted to point out that this very noisy part of the spectrum, which is known as the Lyman Alpha Forest, um, is caused due to nitro, uh, neutral hydrogen, uh, just like the Lyman Alpha uh, line. And it is found blueward of the Lyman alpha emission line and is caused due to emissions from neutral hydrogen, as I mentioned. Um, and this is something that you'll notice uh, at these high redshifts. So you'll notice this very noisy part of the spectrum. Um, and if you notice just blueward of that, uh, the spectrum starts to approach a flux of zero. Um, so it's, it's more of like a standard high redshift quasar. All right, so this is another uh, interesting quasar that I had found. Um, so we've been looking at a lot of spectra, and I think most of the ones that I've showed until now all look very different. Um, but I think uh, what's similar about them are the broad emission lines, as I mentioned. Um, However, if you'll notice that uh, this spectra, a spectrum in particular, has very broad and strong carbon-3 and magnesium uh, emission lines, uh, which we didn't see until now. Uh, it is a very low redshift quasar, and it is uh, a usual blue quasar. Um, but these lines, if we were to look further into, uh, into it, um, such characteristics of a spectrum, uh, can help with understanding what is going on within the quasar as well as in its surroundings, that is within the galaxy um, that is surrounding the quasar, um, as well as things that are happening along the line of sight. And so this is not remarkable, but this is something interesting that um, people that are interested in these types of quasars uh, study. Um, this is another example of a very high redshift quasar. So this is the largest um, redshift that uh, you'll see today. Um, it's a redshift of 4.49. Um, as you can see, the Lyman alpha forest that I mentioned before is here, and we have a strong Lyman alpha emission. Um, here we can also see, again, the dropping of the flux to zero. Um, some of the things that could potentially be interesting in it is the carbon four and how, if I were to zoom into this. Um, yeah, so if you notice uh, on the right side of carbon four, it's 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 very slopey. So there's no um, noise or no emission lines. And, and that can tell us a little bit about what's going on in our line of sight, that there is no gas blocking our line of sight. Um, so that can potentially be interesting. Um, but this is a standard uh, high redshift uh, quasar. But when I first looked at it, I was confused because of this sudden jump of flux. Uh, if you notice around 6,700 angstroms. Um, but this is very standard for a high redshift quasar. Um, so it's not necessarily very remarkable, um, but it's interesting to look at. All right, so this is a spectrum of a quasar with strong O6 emission. Um, I should mention that these uh, O6 and magnesium two and all of these numerals with these um, elements are talking about the ionization states. Um, so O6 emission is not as common. Um, so it can potentially be interesting as it's 
in any other spectra, if you notice, we don't see any emission from O6. Um, so these are um, the types of emissions that are rare. Um, and one thing that we were doing during our research was we were trying to find such um, like different kind of properties uh, when it came to emission and absorption so that we could report it to uh, people that are experts on quasars and then they can further look into um, different kinds of quasars um, since people are studying more particular kind of quasars as well. Um, so that's why this was something that I found to be interesting uh, and I had reported it. Uh, it's also a high redshift quasar, so it's approximately 3.26 redshift. All right, so now that we've looked at a lot of quasar spectrum and uh, people are probably very tired of looking at spectra, let's look at some more spectrum. Um, and this time, let's look at cataclysmic variables just for fun. So it will be a very quick um, look over. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, cataclysmic variables are basically a white dwarf eating up a late type star, um, as shown in this image. So they're interesting. Um, to me, what the most interesting part about cataclysmic variables were was how it at different stages of it, uh, the white dwarf eating up the star, it goes from these Balmer emission and Pastian uh, emission, sorry, Balmer absorption and Pastian absorption lines to um, Balmer emission and Pastian em emission lines. So to me, that was very interesting how it just went from um, this to this uh, in two stages of its life. Um, and when I found both of these labeled as cataclysmic variables, I was very confused. Um, but if you'll notice, this spectra looks very similar to how we expect the spectrum of a white dwarf to look like. Um, as I showed to you guys in, in the very start, uh, the first spectrum that we looked at looked almost like this. So it makes sense since a cataclysmic variable consists of a white dwarf. Um, so I just wanted to show that. All right, so now I'd like to end off uh, my talk by giving a little bit of a bigger picture of what we talked about. Um, and so why are quasars important and why looking at all of these spectra and studying all of these properties uh, is important? So if we talk about quasars, what, what they can help us with is they can help us look in, uh, far into the universe due to their high luminosity, since they're the brightest objects known to us, and therefore they're uh, visible to lar uh, larger distances. And the farther away we look into the universe, um, the more back in time we're looking, and so we can really go more into the depth of the early, uh, understanding the early universe. And since they are part of galaxies, they can help us in understanding galaxy formation and evolution. Since it's very interesting that a galaxy has this supermassive black hole sitting in its center, and then there's this accreting material surrounding it, which is so much more luminous than the entire galaxy itself. Like even thinking about the fact that the core of the galaxy, which is just a few, just a just a little bit larger than the entire solar system can be more luminous than the entire galaxy. So I think that that can really help us uh, in understanding galaxy formation and evolution since it is cent uh, centric to the galaxy. Um, and they're so far away and there's uh, so many faint distant galaxies between our Milky Way galaxy and distant quasars that the quasars often shine through these other galaxies. Um, for example, like a flashlight, uh, if it were to shine through a series of clouds. So the gas in those uh, galaxies often leave absorption lines in the quasar spectra. So we can study the galaxies without even seeing them directly. So there was no other way we would be able to study all of these galaxies if we didn't have quasars uh, and the light of quasars reaching us. Um, so that's why they're very interesting and very important um, to astrophysicists. All right, thank you everyone for your attention. Um, and I'm here if you have any questions.
Thank you, Mahin. It was a very informative presentation. Sorry about the previous technical difficulties, everyone. I will now repeat the introduction. For today's Teletube episode, our guest speaker is Mahin Hamani, who is in her fourth year of undergraduate honors degree in astrophysics at York University. Mahin has always been captivated by astronomy, but she discovered the schools at the time did not frequently cover the subject in depth. Nevertheless, she participated in a number of STEM programs in Pakistan to learn more about the subject and get active in amateur observational astronomy. She joined York University in 2020 and learned to determine solar rotation periods, classify galaxies, and detect exoplanets in various astronomy courses. Furthermore, she joined Alan R. Caswell Observatory and worked there for two years where she engaged in continuing research on variable stars and learned how to operate the one meter telescope, which is the biggest on any Canadian university campus. Some of her research interests are dark energy, dark matter, and the origin and evolution of the universe. She worked as a research assistant under the supervision of Dr. Patrick Hall, who is the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University. Her talk tonight was about the work she has performed under his supervision this summer. We're glad to have you tonight, Mahin. Next, we will be asking a couple of you a questions regarding your talk. Thank you for your fascinating, insightful presentation, Mahin. I especially like the variety of spectra that you were able to see of quasars. <laughs> My first question for you is, what is one thing you never expected to learn during your research? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so what comes to mind right now, right away, is um, not really in a sense of what I learned during my research in terms of um, the things I worked with, but just this knowledge thing that I wasn't aware that it is that we don't have quasars existing anymore um that to me was very mind-blowing because i it's unfortunate that i did not know that quasars don't exist anymore and it makes sense because the light from them is coming from so far away uh that it is possible that they don't exist anymore so i would say that was one thing i never expected i'd learn during the research interesting my second question for you is, what astronomical objects do you learn about other than quasars? Um, so other than quasars, we looked at a lot of other spectra, particularly of stars. So we looked at hot stars, cold stars, um, like all types of stars. Uh, as I showed, we also looked at some cataclysmic variables, binary stars. Uh, that I found particularly interesting because of how um, their spectra are like a combination of two different types of stars. So it's like a curve. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, and to be able to have those to compare with uh, the quasar spectra uh, really helped with um, studying quasars in a better way. Thank you very much, Mickey. Thank you for your presentation, Mahina. I have two questions for you. My first question is, what is the most interesting piece of information you can learn from analyzing a quasar? Um, so I think that there's a lot you could potentially learn from uh, analyzing a quasar. Um, but what I think would be the mo most interesting part of all of it is the bigger picture that I talked about in my talk is like being able to understand the uh, evolution and the origin of the galaxies and how they came into being since it is so it is at the center of the galaxy and um it's just so fascinating that there could be something so luminous at the center of the galaxy and then there's a black hole there um so i think that is uh the not the piece of information like a very very big piece of information that we can learn from quasars I completely agree. It's very exciting. My second question is, what tools do you use when analyzing the absorption and emission properties of a quasar? Um, when it came to the research that I did, uh, we did use uh, a couple of softwares to be able to really zoom into different spectra and as well as um, 
really uh, and like look at the emission and the absorption features more properly. Uh, so we did use those uh, softwares, but apart from those, um, we also had these softwares that we could use to compare spectra from different uh, time periods so that we could see any differences that have appeared within those spectra over time. Uh, so those are some of the tools that can help with really seeing how, if there's been any changes over time. Um, so that's what we were in particular using. That is very interesting. Thank you for answering my questions. Now we'll be giving it away to Mariana. Thanks, Kim. And that was an amazing presentation, Mahim. I do have a couple of questions of my own. To start off, what advice would you give to someone that wants to get into the same field or a similar field of study? Um, I think uh, one thing that I could have um, used if I had done it before was uh, being more aware of uh, whatever is going on right now uh, in terms of space research um, and astrophysics research, since there's so many missions there's james webb space telescope there's so many new missions being launched so many telescopes the sloan digital sky survey that the information is constantly being updated and they're just reading up on all of that and being aware of what's going on can really help since there's so much information to take in uh, at once so just doing that beforehand could really help that was wonderful advice. Thank you. And my last question is, what made you want to study quasars in particular? That's a very good question. Um, I, I don't have a very uh, deep reason as to why I wanted to study quasars, uh, but mainly because I didn't know what quasars really were, but it, like in depth, like I knew what quasars were, but I didn't know what quasars were, if that makes sense. So I just want to understand them more in depth. And I knew that they they play an important role when it comes to uh, understanding the evolution of the universe. And I've always been very intrigued by that. Uh, so that is the reason why I wanted to get more involved um, and start with uh, research in quasars. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your very interesting presentation and for answering my questions. And now I'll like to pass it over to Pramit. Hi, everyone. I have some questions as well. Uh, first of all, I know you already mentioned that the closest quasar was about 800 million light years away. So can you just describe what it's like? Yeah, so... Um... When it comes to what it's like, it's just like similar to what I talked about. Um, I don't know if that one is like different from the other quasars or what a general quasar looks like. But if I were to just guess, it's probably just like a standard quasar with a supermassive black hole with um, accreting material surrounding it. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure uh, when it comes to that exact um, quasar, which is the closest one. Okay, I see. And my second question is, how do scientists detect quasars in our sky and collect data from them? So when it comes to quasars uh, detection, I'm pretty sure like a lot of um, like a lot of people are working on quasars. So I did read about James Webb Space Telescope um, trying to image quasars and working with quasars. Uh, but since I was working with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, I can tell a little bit about what they're doing. So they have, they're basically mapping the sky. So they've mapped like the quarter of the sky. And so they have different targets um, when it comes to quasars that they're pointing at. Um, and so they're collecting not just spec uh, spectrographic data, but they're also collecting images uh, of different quasars. Um, which you can look up on the legacy survey if you wanted to. Um, by putting in ARIA and DEC of whatever target you want to look at. Um, and so, when, if in general, um, I think spectroscopic data is a very useful tool to be able to analyze anything when it comes in astrophysics because it gives you so much more um, trustworthy information um, in terms of what you're looking at. 
but these are some of the ways that SDSS is doing it. Okay. Thank you very much for answering all of our questions. Well, that's it, everyone. You have been listening to Alan I. Carswell's Observatory's weekly Teletube broadcast, the Astronomy and Astrophysics program, written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Sergey, Cam, Mariana, and myself, Pramit, with our special guest, Mahim. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comments section of the video and talk to us in the chat right now. We will be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you would like to make a donation, see our website at yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. You can always connect with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. Thank you.